join Thursday Bible study, 7 p.m. on Zoom with Renee Warner leading. The Restart team has a meeting set for October 26. Thank you for praying for the Restart team and the church leadership as we continue to monitor the threat of virus at in-person worship. Right now, we are safer at home. And thank you to all who are continuing your financial support as we remain worshiping online. First Church still needs your gifts to make sure ministry continues, and you may either mail your gifts of tithes and offerings to the church office, or you can visit the church website and contribute electronically. Go to www.firstchurchum.com, and on the home page, look for the donate button. And you may drop your offering by the parsonage in the mailbox if you'd like. Again, thank you for gathering together as a digital community of faith, drawing close to God and to one another through a shared worship experience. Let the worship begin. Hear these words based on Psalm 121. I look up at the mountains. From where will my help come in times of trouble? The living God of heaven and earth and these mountains will send the help I need. God holds you firmly in place. God will not let you fall. God who keeps you will never take God's eyes off you and never drift off to sleep. What a relief. 
God never leaves you. The living God keeps you safe, so close to God that God's shadow is a cooling shade to you. Neither bright light of sun nor dim light of moon will harm you. The living God will keep you safe from all of life's evils, from your first breath to your last breath. From this day and forever, God keeps you. Our hymn of praise is, O Spirit of the Living God. Let us pray. Living God, move among us and waken us to your loving presence. When we lose our way and put our confidence in ourselves and our wisdom, call us back to you. Remind us that our very identity is dependent on your abiding presence and grace. Show us how to walk with steadfast faithfulness, following the path of goodness and mercy in our daily lives. May our days and these moments of worship be filled with joy and hope as we share the good news of abundant life that comes from following Jesus Christ. For it is in his name and the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. A choral call to confession, breathe on me, breath of God. Let us pray. Patient God, we are so easily distracted from what you would have us be and what you would have us do. We allow ourselves to be claimed by the angry and 
hurting world as though we were created in hostility to be reflections of hostility. You remind us that from the beginning, your love has been available to us. Forgive us when we so easily turn toward ignorance and selfish as ways of living in the world. Heal our wounded souls. Challenge us to be your people, not owned by false promises, but strengthened and empowered to be those who bring your hope through our words and actions. In Jesus' name we pray. In our world, in our words, smiles, and compassionate living, we bear the image of God. In our willingness to serve the voiceless and alienated, the lost and alone, God's presence abides with us. Rejoice! You are called beloved of God, and the one who loves you the most pours blessing upon you. Let us pray together the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the choral response is verses 3 and 4 of Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's time for wiggle time. <coughs> Happy Sunday, campers. Well, I hope you're enjoying the beautiful fall weather. It is a little cooler outside, but my goodness, aren't things beautiful outside? As the leaves change and, and God's creation, it becomes even more beautiful than it's been all summer. I was thinking this morning about a, about a story to share with you about a little girl who attended a fall 
party for some of her friends. It was a church, actually, and they called it a fall party because, well, the weather wasn't too hot, it wasn't too cold, and, and everybody, everybody got together that day to play in the playground at the church, and, and they had food and cake and all those kinds of things. And as they were getting ready to leave, some of the leaders gave all of the kids that were present at the fall party a gift bag. Now, in the gift bag, there wasn't anything really that big. Uh, there was some candy, and uh, there was a, an apple, some caramels in there to make a caramel apple when they got home. And, and there was a pencil, I think, and, and a, maybe a, a new box of crayons, all the things that you like to play with and, and, and you enjoy. And one of the things they put in there was, was an ornament kit. Now, you know what an ornament is. It's a Christmas ornament that you you put on the Christmas tree, but it was one of those kits that you you could take some glue and some paint and everything that was needed for the little ornament kit was included in this little package. This and it was in this gift bag. Well, as the kids were going through their gift bags, one little boy became extremely upset. He actually started crying, and he said, "I don't have an ornament." Well, the ornament was going to be, it was a special ornament. It was a, a little, it was made with popsicle sticks. It made a stable and had little figures of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in it. And they would be able to glue it together and paint it and put it on their Christmas tree. Everybody got one but this little guy. He was upset. Tears were flowing. And one of the little girls said, he can have mine. I already have Jesus on my Christmas tree. So she gave him her ornament kit, and, and he was happy. And, and well, the party ended, and everybody went home. And, and after the party, one of the moms walked over to the little girl and said, I saw what you did for that little boy. And the little girl didn't really know what to say. She just kind of smiled, and she said, You know, I think I could see... Jesus in you. Not only do you have Jesus on your Christmas tree, you've got Jesus in your heart. It's wonderful that we're able to share Jesus from our heart with those that, that need it. That little guy that day became really upset because he didn't have a Jesus Christmas ornament in his gift bag. But that little girl took care of him that day. Not only did she give him the Jesus ornament, I think she gave him Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your love and for your grace. I thank you, O oh God, for our kids and our kids' families and what they mean to me and to this church family. Continue, O oh God, to keep them safe and pour your blessings upon them and help us all to know, O oh Lord, that when Jesus is with us. We're able to give Jesus to others. Amen. Still my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, be faithful.
Thank you, singers. I invite you to hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The word of God for God's people this day. Thanks be to God. Seek God while God's here to be found. Pray to God while God's close at hand. Come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. Beautiful words from Isaiah 55. Seek God while God's here to be found. Pray because God is close at hand and so merciful and full of forgiveness. Dr. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead used to tell the story of a woman who was trying to find God. She had a reoccurring dream that she was looking through a thick plate glass window I imagine her face and hands pressed against the glass and cupping the sides of her face around her eyes, and it seemed as though she was seeing God on the other side. She banged on the window with her hands, rattling the window, trying to get God's attention, but God didn't even notice her. She hammered and she pounded on the window, and soon she desperately began shouting at God at the top of her voice, nothing. And finally, after just leaning against the plate glass and getting no response to her desperate attempts to gain God's attention, a quiet, calm voice, a voice right at her side said, why are you making so much noise? There's nothing between us. I'm right here. Hear again the words from Isaiah. Seek God while God's here to be found. Pray to God while God's close at hand. Come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. And then the following words according to Isaiah is God's response. I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way I work. Seek God while God's here to be found. The Columbia River is the largest river in the Pacific Northwest and forms most of the border between Washington and Oregon. And in the Columbia River, there is a famous spot where a natural spring wells up when the Pacific Ocean is at low tide, and people come to dip their containers in that pure spring water for drinking. And then the tide comes in and the spring is immersed by the ocean and salt water and the current of the ocean tides. You may think that the spring stops flowing at high, at high tide. But when divers dove underwater at high tide, they discovered that you can still see the clear, fresh water rushing from that spring. That the spring is still there even though the salty tide washes over it. There are overwhelming times 
in all of our lives, when the tide comes in, the tide of heartache and despair, the tide of sin and anger and judgmentalism, the tide of family conflict and disappointment, the tide of responsibility and sometimes the unfortunate inability to meet those responsibilities, the rush of modern living, the tide of needing more than our means or confused priorities, the tide of illness and grief, the tide of betrayal and the loss of love, or the tide of a whole swarm of rip currents that can take us down and take us away like a crashing wave. Sometimes it's hard for us to find the spring of clear, pure water that we so desperately need to refresh our empty and overspent spirits. That's part of the reason the church comes together in whatever form we can as the body of Christ. Gathered together in the presence of Christ's Spirit, we are able to rediscover those springs of fresh living water that come up from the quiet center to fill that God-shaped place deep inside us. There's a beautiful song in the faith we sing hymnal that I love. And sometimes we sing it just before we pray as a church family. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are freed. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see all the things that really matter. Be at peace and simply be. Indeed, there are times when the church family gathers, when we have been filled till our cups are overflowing, and so we are reminded to find again that quiet center. Seek the Lord while God may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I don't remember the author's name, but I remember the story. It was a story of a young writer who was gathering material for his book, The Greatest Desire, was the title. It's kind of a story about a writer writing a book about writing a book, if that makes any sense. Anyway, in his preparations and research, he questioned people with one question. What do you want? And he wouldn't let anyone give vague, ambiguous answers. If someone answered, I want to be an engineer, the writer would follow with, but why do you want to be an engineer? What do you really want? And much of the time, he tracked down their greatest desire. Perhaps a young writer should have consulted with 70-year-old Rudyard Kipling for when Kipling feverishly stirred so restlessly a week before he died, his nurse asked him if he wanted anything, and he murmured, I want God. I may be a naive and you may not agree with me, but I believe whether we humans care to admit it or not, God is the greatest desire of any heart. There is a God-shaped void at the core of all of us that can be filled only by God. The modern-day opiate is to claim that the God-shaped void doesn't exist, but until that void is filled, filled until God is in that place in our hearts where God should be, there remains a hollow emptiness. I believe it. Without God in that place, we struggle in our incompleteness. 
In Acts 17, we find these words. And the Lord has made from one blood every nation so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might find the Lord, though the Lord is not far from each one of us. So, we come seeking God. We come praying. God can be found, you know, but the interesting thing is that in searching for God, we always discover that God has been searching for us. That's the testimony of the New Testament. The shepherd out on a hillside searching for the lost sheep until the lost sheep is found. It's not we who stand at God's door and humbly knock. It is God who takes the initiative. It is God who knocks at our heart's door. It's not that we may find God, but that we might be quiet enough and still enough so that we can hear the soft knocking of God upon the door of our hearts. God said, why are you making so much noise? There's nothing between us. The story is told of an East Coast fishing village that was especially depressed and nearly destitute because of years of very poor fishing and an even poorer fish market. The townspeople and Local fishermen decided to hold a meeting in one last attempt to resolve their complicated economic problems. A stranger showed up at the meeting and he tried several times to speak, but there was a bit of a closed community prejudice in that town. And the visitor, a foreigner to the locals, was interrupted each time he tried to speak. The locals wouldn't allow an outsider to become involved in their discussion. A latecomer to the meeting showed up just as the ignored visitor was leaving and they passed each other shoulder by shoulder in the entrance. And the latecomer asked some of the people, what was he doing here? Did he offer help? Is he going to help us? Not, really, not realizing who he was talking about, the members of the town meeting asked if he knew who the stranger was. And the, re, the latecomer replied, yes, as a matter of fact, I do know who that was. I saw his boat docked in the harbor. That was John D. Rockefeller Sr., The whole town had ignored someone who certainly possessed the resources to help them. Seek God while God is here to be found. Pray to God while God's close at hand. Come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. How Often God comes to us, but we do not recognize God or welcome God's presence. But God comes. And for those who are seeking and those who are sensitive, they encounter the divine. A while ago, a noted columnist told of visiting a state penitentiary to interview a prisoner serving time for murder. She writes, Imagine my surprise upon going through the men's division to see on the walls of a prison cell the picture of the Good Shepherd. By permission of the warden, I secured an interview with this man. I asked about the picture. This is what he said. Well, long ago at home, my mother had a picture like that. 
She always told us that no matter what we had done, if we were truly sorry and tried to do better, one day the good shepherd would find us and take us back into the shelter of his fold. And she taught us a little prayer too. I've wandered far and have never been any good to myself or to anyone else. And I'm sorry for my wasted life. Every night I say that prayer, and somehow I'd like to think he will find me one day and take me back again. The prayer was more of a mantra, a chant really, but nevertheless the prisoner prayed the words over and over Seek the Lord while he may be found. Seek the Lord while he may be found. God is so very near to us. Of course, we see God most clearly in the person of Jesus Christ. And Isaiah the prophet knew that God was very near to him, but he had only the vaguest outline of the character of God. He didn't have the model of Christ as we post-resurrection people have. He couldn't see God hold little children in his arms or forgive the woman of the streets as she washed his feet with her, with her tears or heal the blind man on the road to Jericho or stop the stoning of a woman caught in adultery or the resurrection of Lazarus or Jairus' daughter. The prophet had no sight of Golgotha and the Savior on a cross. For all his exalted wisdom as a prophet of God, Isaiah could not see God as clearly as you and I. There was an interview published with Carl Reiner, the director of the 1977 movie, Oh God, shortly after that movie came out. And the story centers on an average and somewhat befuddled supermarket manager, Jerry Landers, who was played by John Denver, chosen by God, the cigar-puffing George Burns, to revive God's message despite the skepticism of the media, religious community, and the supermarket manager's own wife. The movie set much of the Christian community on its ear for making fun of God. Some Christian communities even shunned some of their members for watching the movie. Anyway, Carl Reiner discussed some of the problems they had in directing the 90-year-old George Burns in the lead role. It seems that George kept trying to act and talk like he assumed God would. They had kept telling him, George, don't be God. Be George Burns. That's the whole point of the movie. God becomes George Burns. It's really no wonder that George Burns had trouble the mere idea that one man could reveal the character of God is really, truly amazing, and maybe even blasphemy for some on a 1977 move and sc movie screen, but that's the good news of the gospel. In the person of Jesus Christ, God came alongside us, and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ Jesus stays with us. Seek the Lord while you may be found. God says, why are you making so much noise? There's nothing between us. Now, of course, there are people we encounter who will never see God unless they see God in us. 
The gospel lesson today reminds us of the great commandment to love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and all your mind. And those words are followed with the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. There are those whom we will encounter who will never read, will never allow themselves to be exposed to the story of Jesus Christ. And there are people whose lives are so overwhelmed with the tides of life that wash over them that in their hour of need, it is nearly impossible for them to ever be aware of the loving, ever-abiding presence of God unless they seek God while God is here to be found. There are people who will so insulate, insulate their lives from the voice of God that in their hour of need, it will be nearly impossible for them to ever be aware of the loving, ever-abiding presence of God. The barriers they've constructed are so durable and so impenetrable, it little, literally would take an act of God to force through if God were that kind of a forceful God. But if only they could see God in us, then they will know that God is near. You see, God and God's love is reflected in our love for others. It's kind of like the young man whose girlfriend lived in another city he wanted to have an engagement ring to give to her when he proposed, so he sought the help of a friend who was a jeweler. And in time, after, after designing the ring, he was shown the materials before the actual engagement ring was made. The diamond looked just like any other rock, and the gold was a dull, brassy color, not at all like the gold he had seen used in other jewelry. So the young man questioned the jeweler about the gold, and the jeweler told him that it had not yet been refined. Still in doubt about the eventual beauty of his girlfriend's engagement ring, he asked, and how do you know when it is pure enough? And that's when the jeweler responded, as he held the unfinished jewelry in his skilled hand, I will know the gold is pure enough when I can see my face in it. That's the kind of life God longs for us to have. A life that so reflects God and God's love that others discover God reflected in us. People of God, the world sees God most clearly in us. When our response to God's love and forgiveness is a love for God that's alive enough to love others as God loves us. Seek the Lord while he may be found. God is so very near to us. It's true now. And it will be true forever. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We do not have to go far to find God, for the Almighty is already coming to us. When Jesus took our sins to the cross, he took away the tide of a whole swarm of rip currents that can take us down like crashing waves. Seek the Lord while he's here to be found. Pray to God while God's close at hand. Come back to God who is merciful. Come back to God who is lavish with forgiveness.
Imagine God asking you, why are you making so much noise? And hear the one who loves you the most say, there's nothing between us. Our closing hymn is How Firm a Foundation. Now go from these moments with the confidence that you are God's beloved children and go to extend God's love to others with steadfast hope and joyous trust. And as you go, take with you the continual awareness that the living God goes ahead of you and abides with you always. In God's mercy, the Spirit's power, and the grace of Jesus Christ, Go in peace. Amen. Amen.